Facts, and now on with the show. Welcome to this special edition of the IFS Zooms In. Rather than me interviewing someone, as usual, this week, we're offering you the opportunity to listen to the IFS annual lecture, which we were delighted was given this year by Nobel laureate Professor Jean Tirol, a good friend of the IFS and indeed a member of the IFS Deaton Review of Inequalities. Jean Tirol, of course, is famous for his work on competition and regulation, uh, but in this lecture really applies his extraordinary insights to some of the big moral and ethical and practical questions facing all of us, bringing economics to life as a way of thinking about the big public policy questions of our time. What are the market failures that we as a society, we as a world need to deal with? What are the government failures, crucially, that we need to deal with? What are the ethical problems in action that we continually face? How do we misunderstand and understand the information and data in front of us? How do we think about privacy? How do we respond to climate change? So I I commend to you Uh, the next hour or so of listening to one of the great thinkers of our time offering his expertise and his advice on how to think through some of the big issues of our time. It's uh, it's really great to be together again, and it's the first time actually I I can do it after all those Zooms. And also this annual IFS lecture is is wonderful for me because uh, it's like a role model for Europe, I think, and and the world. The kind of work which is done for the common good and try to get science-based policy recommendations. So, So it's a great pleasure to be giving this IFS lecture. A lot of people actually say that given that we have gone through a very big crisis with COVID, now we are ready to actually confront the challenge of uh, climate change and equality and and whatever AI and all the issues we are going to face in the next few years. Some are um, suspicious of that. Uh, it's a kind of wishful thinking. And what I would like to talk about is how we perhaps we can change our institution and also the way we are acting so as to avoid going back to business as usual, which is my best predictor, I guess, uh, for what's going to happen. Uh, now, I'm not going to give you any solution. I'm going to go through the thinking that we might conduct and, um, and leave a lot of question marks, but I think it's an interesting thing to do. So let me start with things you all know, but just so that everybody is on the same wavelength with the common good. So on on the common good, as we all know, there are lots of things we do which are not aligned with uh, general interest. So as consumers, we pollute too much, uh, we may fail to be vaccinated, we drive too fast and so on and so forth. Same thing, businesses actually and banks may take too much risk and jeopardize the welfare of their of their depositors or their workers. We all know the states uh, engage in uh, excessive spending and despite that provide poor education often, uh, create financial crisis, don't solve inequality and so on. And uh, I'm not going to mention all the issues that come from uh, my country first. Um, so the common thing with all those phenomena, of course, is that the private interest is not aligned with the general interest. And the economics of the common good is really trying to make sure that the institution forces us actually to align our actions with the general interest. Now, I'm going to criticize that a little bit later on, but I think the right way to, to start. Now, what are the instruments? The first instrument is, of course, persuasion. So we economists tend to think about incentives, uh, but persuasion is often emphasized by other social sciences. And the idea is really to encourage good citizen uh, behavior so that you you, you should not pollute, in a sense, corporate social responsibility, socially responsible investment, and the like, and do some norms-based intervention. So you try to convey to people information about the consequences of their selfish behavior or the social norm itself. So there's a whole literature in sociology about how to do it. And that's all important, of course, but it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient because we see that incentives are needed. You know, if you just take uh, climate change, for example, we have been exhorting people for 29 years now because, you know, much of what, what was at COP 
21 in Paris was already at Rio in 1992. And we exhort people to actually to change their behavior and very little has happened since. So at some point you need incentives. Sometimes you can combine both. Actually a combination of incentive and, and persuasion can work pretty well even in cases where you cannot use incentive because there is no one watching, uh, you still get good behavior. And I was kind of surprised of the change in behavior relative to tobacco, for example, in Spain or in France. I, I didn't predict that it would work so well in a sense. Now, defining the common good, I think the best thing we have is actually, and all the trick, which is a veil of ignorance. We all have a position in society and of course, you know, we are biased by who we are. And the idea is to go back and just imagine a thought experiment that we are not born yet. And we don't know whether we'll be a man or woman, or whether we'll be born in a rich or poor family, in a well-to-do neighborhood with good schools, uh, in which religion and so on and so forth, or even each, in which country. And you ask yourself, what kind of society would I like to live in? It sounds simple, it's complicated as well, but because you really have to abstract yourself from who you are. And you know, just think that you are a random member of the overall population. But even this thought experiment, which is kind of a little bit naive, gives you a lot of conclusions. So for example, all kinds of insurance mechanism against where you are born, in what family, for example, it's a equal education, which is a fundamental thing, you know, equal chances in, in life is a really thing. But also uh, solve all kinds of mishaps you might uh, inc incur in life. Health, health crimes, income, unemployment, and so on and so forth. So get insurance. Uh, of course, you want uh, an efficient economy, so you want uh, all kinds of regulations to make markets more efficient. Supervision, banking supervision, uh, antitrust, and, and so on. And also you want some kind of regulation of societal interaction, so kind of tolerance with respect to other people's religion or ethnicity. Uh, that you, you get, of course, uh, from the veil of ignorance. And of course, what we want is a long-term vision. Uh, I'm going to come back to that, but of course, the issue with politics, and you know, I'm not criticizing politicians, but they, their main thinking is, of course, about the next election. And that means that that has a number of consequences, because if you think about what climate change or poor education or lack of pension reforms or inequality have in common, it's always the same point, which is that if you don't do anything for a year, for two years, it doesn't matter. You don't see any, any change fundamentally. So until the next election, why should you spend money on that? So basically, this is what happens, but of course, a year plus a year plus a year, that decades of inaction, and those are time bombs. So we social scientists, we must actually push this long-term vision because the incentives of those who are in power, and again, it's not a criticism, are oriented toward the short term. And also without prejudging instruments. So that's going to bring me to my next topic. And one of those instruments is the market. That is pretty controversial, especially in the country I'm living in, but not only. The efficiency of a market in, in achieving allocation has been criticized and many famous philosophers have written books on the morality of markets. They almost have the same title. There are just two examples by Harvard, Michael Sandel and uh, Stanford, uh, Deborah Satz. They, almost all those books and there are other famous philosophers who also have written similar books. They almost have the same title, but they have pretty different content. They almost all are concerned with exactly the same examples, markets we may not want to have. But of course, the most famous one is the one of Michael Sandel, which was a bestseller. And here yeah, I'm reading from his, from his work, basically a wide range of goods and services, including babies for adoption, surrogate motherhood, sexuality, drugs, military service, votes, and organs for transplantation are not to be commoditized through markets. So they are not being, they should not be taken care of through markets. Uh, no more than friendship admissions to elite university or Nobel prizes are to be bought, um, or genes or other life forms are to be patented. Now I'm not disagreeing necessarily with, uh, with those assertions. The question is how do you get to that and what do you do about it? That's going to be my question. So 
in economics for, for the common good. I basically disagree with this approach. And not, I mean, Michael Sandel, Debra Satz is much more balanced in terms of reasoning, I think. But uh, basically, I try to identify what's wrong with what's wrong. Not again that I necessarily disagree with the conclusion. That's a different matter. It's a way of reaching the conclusion, which often is indignation. And indignation is not something I like so much. I, I like it as a warning signal. So when I feel indignant about something, that means that something, I feel something may be wrong. That's the first step, I would say. But then the indignation should stop there. And what we should be doing is try to think about what's wrong, why it's wrong in a sense, because that's going to help us understand what the solutions are. And, you know, more assertions uh, really can override the freedom of others. So until recently and still today in many countries, sex between people of the same sex or different races was thought of as being immoral by a big majority of people. And they were imposing their indignation on a minority of people uh, without any justification, just because they found that completely immoral. And that's not all right. Okay, you, you have to explain why at some point. And the second reason why I feel uncomfortable about indignation is that those markets exist anyway. So we should not put our head in the sand. We should really try to understand what to do with that. Because, you know, you can say, I don't like prostitution, I don't like organ markets or surrogate motherhood, fine. <laughs> But you know, those markets exist whether you like them or not. So you really have to think about uh, what's going on. So identify market failures, and, uh, and that, of course, is a central task of economics. And I really think economics is a more than phys philosophical science. The next thing I want to argue, and that would be kind of obvious to many of you, is that actually many of those things are standard market failures. And you know, Sure, you can feel uh, they are completely immoral, but there are also very good economic reasons for not accepting the market as they are. So the first reason is classic externalities. We usually use the term externality for things like carbon emissions, for example, or underconsumption of vaccine or overconsumption of antibiotics. So start up Pigouvian uh, analysis. Uh, which is well known, but if you think about it, the same kind of argument applies to other things as well, which are with immoral markets. So for example, do you want babies for adoptions to be given to the highest bidder? You could have a market for babies for adoptions, they are, they are scarce, and why don't you sell them to the highest bidder? Okay, yeah, I mean, you, you might feel, ah, with, what, what is he talking about? Uh, who is this guy who is speaking now? Uh, it is a very simple externality is a person who is going to get the child, going to take good care of this child and love this child. And there's a third party who is not part in the contract, just like for child labor, just like for slavery. I mean, you know, it's just like a very basic anxiety that we don't want to accept. Same thing, I mean, markets for votes. Okay, I can sell you my vote, but it might be a good transaction for you and me, but except that, of course, and there are lots of externalities on my selling my vote to you uh, on third parties. Now, perhaps more interesting is what's called image externality. So image externality is basically the idea that when you do something, even it fits fine for yourself, you actually uh, might damage the image of a group of people. So an interesting example was like 25 years ago, a French administrative court actually uh, used the externality argument. There was this stupid practice, but people seem to like it, where you take a little person and you throw this little person as far as you can in a, in a nightclub or something like that. And that has happened in most countries actually until recently. Um, and people pay to see that. Now why, don't ask me why, but you know. They, they pay to see that. Now, the interesting part in the uh, 1995 decision of a court is that actually the, the little person actually was the one suing for the right actually to exercise his job. It's, apparently, it's not dangerous, and he says, you know, this is my job, this is my living. I have the right actually to do it. So why the nightclub with, which is hiring me um, is paying me, and I, I'm willing to do it. There's no danger and so on. So why do you don't you let me do that? And 
the opinion of the court is that that was fine for him, but there was anxiety on the image of, of small people. And same thing for prostitution. And I mean, that's not the only reason why you might be upset about those markets, but uh, there's certainly one thing. Imperfectly competitive markets, uh, we all know about that. We know that uh, incomplete information and asymmetric information are important. You know, of course, for example, if you, if you think about things which are addictive, uh, like OxyContin or, or contract pregnancy and, and the like, you, you, you know, the person may not anticipate the, the consequences in the long term. Same thing for kidney cells. You may not quite anticipate what, uh, what's going to happen to you in a few years. Uh, or it could be asymmetric information. So, you know, I found this example of Michael Sandel a bit weird. I mean, who is thinking that he or she might pay for friendship or admission in a university? Right? That makes no sense. Because if you pay, if I pay you to be my friend, of course, I'll never know whether you're my friend. Right? And, you know, if you graduate from UCL, but you have paid for it, I'm not paying, I'm not saying paying for the tuition, you're paying for admission, for being selected. Then, who knows? I mean, of course, you know, the, the value of the diploma will, will, will go down very, very quickly. So, you know, it makes, it makes no sense. It's just a very classical asymmetric information issues. Same thing with all kinds of market issues we, we don't like, uh, including price gouging. Of course, talking about market power raises issues about uh, the post-COVID uh, mood coming back to industrial policy for good and bad reasons. And there's all debate about that. Um, and you know, my own view is kind of uh, in the middle. I'm not, I'm not saying we should never use industrial policy, but I'm saying don't use industrial policy unless you do it well, unless you introduce the right governance. And again, you know, my experience in my own country is not a great experience, but there are ways of doing it well. The problem with that is that when you talk to politicians, they want to start a new initiative, you know, to create a new chip or a new uh, battery or a new whatever. And you know, at first, they don't even ask what the supply is and whether they have the people who are going to make it happen. But also, they don't put the right governance in place. You know, they, they won't put their name on some, uh, some program, but then they don't check what's going to happen in this program because they don't put in place the right governance. And there are ways of doing that, uh, which I could discuss later on. Internalities, so standard market failure, people don't stand for their own best interest, okay? Uh, they fail to pursue their self-interest, in general due to some kind of self-control issue. So in general, the reason why we regulate drugs and alcohol and smoking and junk food is simply that uh, people are too oriented towards their short-term well-being and of course ignore the long-term consequences. And again, it's a very standard argument. The, the thing is that uh, you can apply that to repugnant markets as well. So let's forget about slavery. What about voluntary slavery? So I sign with you a contract. Uh, I'm well informed and there's no, there is no duress. And uh, you know, um, I just want to do it. I want to sign a contract saying you give me a lot of money today and then I'm your slave forever. Well, let's assume it's doable. <laughs> I'm sure the treasury will not like that, but uh, why not? I mean, it's a contract between two people. But of course, the danger is that, you know, I would like to have the money right away and discount basically what's going to happen for me during the rest of my life. Same thing, this argument has been invoked for organ sales. People sell their kidney for 500 pounds or a couple of hundred pounds. They have the money right now, maybe for their family actually. Of course, you know, later on they're, they are less happy. Opioids with this scandal, with a free sample and all those things. So that's the really, uh, very common market failure, which has been regulated in other instances. So, you know, there's nothing special to this regulation of such markets. Inequality, uh, other market failure. And finally, there is a market failure for privacy. I mean, here yeah, now I'm, lo I'm looking uh, to the future a little bit more. And the fact that uh, we social scientists are late actually with thinking about privacy, 
Of course, that's a topic which has been around for, for decades and even centuries, but uh, now it's, things are moving very fast. And the marginal cost of knowing everything about you and knowing everything about your social graph, who are your friends, what are your politics, has gone down to zero. It has gone down to zero because you have AI, you have social networks, you, you have face recognition in streets, you have everything. So now you can know Paul's social network and, and social graph very well it's at no cost, um, which has a lot of consequences. So the one we economists uh, study most often is, of course, the possibility of using that for discrimination. Uh, labor market discrimination, so product market discrimination, discrimination. So, you know, if they know your willingness to pay, of course, you won't get much consumer surplus. There will be a capture of the behavioral surplus more generally. There is the old Erschleifer issue that, uh, you know, if, if there is no regulation, then you won't get health insurance if you have the wrong genes or if you're already sick. That's an issue, but it's, it's not only in health, it's, it can be the case for labor markets or, or personal relationship markets. The four, last four bullet points is another advertising of, of mine. I'm sorry, I'm selling my book, I'm advertising my current research. I'm not working for the common good here, but uh, <laughs> for my own interest. So things like, which I think are important. So for example, the violation of a right to oblivion, which is in every, basically every country's law, uh, many religions, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, which are, is violated, of course, by the information uh, remaining on, on websites forever, which means that you don't get a second chance. And that's, that's an issue. Another issue is the interaction between our public sphere and our private sphere. With colleagues, I mean, all that is done with colleagues, but you know, with colleagues, basically, I've started doing the theory, predicting basically that there will be a crowding out, people will pay more and more attention to the public sphere, and less and less attention to the private sphere. That means that your private sphere relationship will be a degraded version of what they should be, and we have some experiments which go exactly in that direction. There's the issue of divisive issues. Um, so there are consensual issues, which are issues for which basically everyone in this room will agree about, like you know, polluting or committing a crime or insulting someone is not something very nice. I say, oh, everybody will agree in this room. Uh, but there are other things, also maybe not, <laughs> Maybe, maybe this room is a, is a bad example for that, but you know, uh, there are other things for which people disagree, like politics and religion, sexuality, uh, abortion, social issue, vaccination, uh, whatever. That's also something in which you, an area where you might care about your privacy, of course, because you might want to avoid the hostility of people who don't think like you and might become hostile to you, even violent, possibly. So you might want sometimes to take refuge in a safe space, not exhibit your behavior in public spaces. So for example, for a long time, gay people, for example, could not enjoy uh, the public space together uh, because they were afraid of uh, being ostracized or, or, or violence or something. And they were forced to choose a social graph, which were basically like-minded people choosing the same kind of, uh, of behavior and the like. So it's actually an interesting line of research um, because safe spaces also have a lot of, uh, of uh, welfare costs, ancillary welfare costs, in terms of uh, you know, the kind of narrative and the kinds of actions that circulate within those uh, safe spaces. Uh, so it's actually a uh, a very important uh, policy issue. And the last one actually uh, is about the social score, um, which is being put in place in China. And by the way, if you have read the 2021 uh, Artificial Intelligence Act of the European Commission, um, basically it's going to ban this kind of social score. Of course, it's always also throwing the baby with the bathwater because social scores sometimes can be useful, but they are extremely dangerous when you mix them with political compliance, when you mix them with a social graph and so on. 
Um, and you, you basically achieve at very low cost what the, the STASI uh, achieved uh, before. Okay, so market failures, actually that's our bread and butter, to be honest. I mean, that allows us economies to work on something and not say that markets are wonderful all the time. But it's true that um, by and large, we believe in markets, and actually, that's why we work so, so hard to make them better, so, because they have efficiency properties. But the standard uh, response, uh, I guess, I mean, you're going to tell me, probably it, it, it dates back to Adam Smith, but okay, markets are mar have market failures, you need governments. The governments are going to be market fixers, um, and everything will be all right, except, except that governments are captured by lobbies, governments um, have an election, so they are going to pander to the electorate, they are going to be short-termist, and governments, of course, are local, and they, of course, there are issues with jurisdiction. So that's difficult. Um, we certainly believe the state should be a regulator, so correct market failures uh, that I, I mentioned, the many market failures, it should, of course, provide a legal framework. There's been some problem with the, with the funds here, but you know, fund high risk, high reward projects, and so on. The government is not that good at running projects for reasons which are kind of obvious and we could go back to. Now, COVID-19 has been an example of a market cum government failure. <laughs> now, the market failure is pretty clear. It's a standard externality issue. So in terms of social distancing, uh, testing, vaccination, and so on, of course, we don't necessarily take into account the externality we impose on, on to others. But there was a huge government failure as well, or societal failure, I don't know, uh, with a lot of short-termism, lack of preparation. It's not only the supplies. I mean, there were lots in the newspaper about uh, not having masks. Actually, in France, we even said the masks are useless because we didn't have any in stock. Uh, but, you know, all kinds of things. And, and now one of the issues is, of course, the lack of social compact about the pandemic pass. The pandemic pass is something extremely useful, but, you know, there's still a lot of uh, discussion about whether you can impose it. So, so in France, we have this kind of, I was discussing with Paul earlier, we have this kind of mixed system where formally we are very strict. We have a pandemic pass, but actually it's not enforced. And actually, you know, it's very hard to ask people actually to, for their pass. It's difficult, but you know, it's the kind of thing we haven't prepared ourselves. And you have to remember, it's not the last one. Pandemics are not a rare event anymore. And there are other coronaviruses, actually, of course, but that's not the only thing. You have a huge resistance to antibiotics with no anti new antibiotics being produced. You have the melting of the permafrost with all viruses and bacteria being released. You have bacterial warfare. I don't, I don't want to depress you. <laughs> I, you, know, you know, it's a joyous occasion. We're all together <laughs> for the first time in 18 months. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm, well, I will come back to economists as a bearer of bad news. <laughs> but yeah. And, and then there was, of course, uh, the fact that uh, uh, this decline in multilateralism that we have observed, uh, fortunately, one of the presidents have been a bit kicked out. but. Uh, but you know, the national interest is coming back in most countries and that's, that's very scary. You see it a bit, of course, in, uh, in COVID as well. So, you know, this is something that, uh, that is coming back. So let me criticize what I just told you, <laughs> um, which by the way, I believe in it, but, uh, but still it's not enough. Okay. It's really the view that, you know, there are lots of market failures. We know how to fix them. The governments should fix them. Of course, we know the government is doing lots of wrong things, but you know, this is the right approach. I'm not going to give you a solution, but at least I'm going to raise the issues and maybe call for a new research agenda for public economics. And the reason for that is that our morality and our public policies are very much influenced by cognitive biases. I'm going to go through that slowly. 
And it affects, of course, mainly the fields which are in direct contact with society. So, of course, being an economist, I'm sensitive to that, but when you see the reaction to, to the medical profess, to the, to the MDs and, uh, and so on, what you read in biology on evolution is theory in the, in the U.S. or climate change in the U.S. I mean, it's a broader thing is that uh, there is less and less respect for, for science. Now, where does it come from? Because, you know, it's nice to say it is the right policy. And actually, that's, that's one of, our, of the things we, we ask about uh, in the commission that Olivier Blanchard and, uh, and I chaired. And actually, uh, Carol was there, Richard was there, and a couple of other people from the UK, and they helped us a lot. But, you know, if it's so simple, I mean, take carbon pricing, for example. How come such a simple solution on which there is consensus of almost all economists why isn't it implemented? And is that because, you know, it's badly, badly designed the way we do it? Is that because it's not explained well? You know, what's going on? So we, we have to think about the perception at some point. Um, and also the cognitive biases. So the first cognitive bias is motivated beliefs. And we all suffer from that. I certainly suffer from them as well. We believe what we want to believe about the future. I and mean, we want to think we have a bright future. We don't want to be depressed. Listen to an economist talking about pandemics. You know, we, we want to, to actually uh, think about, uh, we have a, you know, we won't have to make too much effort to fight climate change, for example. It's not a pleasant thought. And that's why I think, for example, the, the green growth slogan, which is in almost every country, is kind of dangerous. And you can say, well, if we can have our cake and eat it too, why don't we do it? You know, we spend on green stuff and then we grow faster and we are richer. So why don't we do it? And it's worse than that, actually, because, you know, people take that as, a, uh, as an excuse, actually, for not doing anything. So, you know, we are going to be richer thanks to being green. So why should I do it, put any effort and contribute to the reduction in, in uh, global warming? Uh, we want to believe we have some beliefs about our society. So we don't want to see our society as being unequal. It's a very unpleasant thought. For example, if you think about organ sales and you see someone selling his or her kidney for a couple of hundred pounds, you find that shocking, right? But why do you find that shocking? But in particular, because it reveals to you how unequal our society is. You know, and you know, this is some, something you don't want to see. I don't want to see it, personally. And that shows you, you know, it, it really shows you in front of your eyes that actually the same thing with prostitution. You say, okay, that poor lady, What's going on? I mean, she's just destitute, and that shows she's willing to sell her body for, for money. Um, we also don't want to see society as being violent because it's, it's not very good for, for well-being. We don't want to live in a violent society. So there, is, there was this famous uh, episode that I relate in uh, Economics for the Common Good about uh, the death penalty in France. So from 1939 through 1981, the death penalty um, it, you know, was, was used in France. But instead of having public execution, we had execution in prisons uh, with, without public. Why is that? Because the execution at 4 or 5 a.m., people brought their children and rejoiced, and they found that fun. And, you know, it was very shocking. Actually, they destroyed the movies that showed that. You know, because it's very troubling, right? Yeah. Disturbing to think that people go and see an execution and, and bring their kids at 5 a.m. And, 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 and have a huge amount of fun, right? So they made it, they tried to hide those executions. So that's a, that's a kind of uh, motivated beliefs I have in mind. Now, in that respect, the economist is a bearer of bad news. So I, I don't want to, 
of course, I'm partisan there. I'm biased toward economists. Uh, but it's true that economic analysis is exposing our deep values. And one of the things is, of course, you know, when, when you do careful um, economic analysis, the way it's done at the IFS, of course, then you get numbers. And those numbers are hard to disagree with. And they expose our, our values in a sense. And in a sense, we all want to live in a society where incentives are not needed, right? It would be a nice society, except that that's a la-la land that, um, that doesn't exist. And interestingly, if you are in other fields, that, for example, legal scholars are cl more clever than economists. They don't talk about incentives, they talk about fairness. So when they talk about intellectual property, we say we, we, we need profit in order to, to incentivize R&D, for example. That's crazy. We should not talk like this. We should talk like lawyers and say it's fair. You know, fairness is a much nicer concept than profit and, and time consistency. Same thing, you know, sanctity of, of contracts, more obligation to honor one's promises. You know, it's almost on a religious ground somehow. So we are not very good at selling what we do. Um, at the same time, we have to recognize that uh, we may destroy social norms also. There is danger in that respect, because we, what we are saying really is that people are not as nice as you believe. You know, they need incentive to work, they need incentive not to pollute, they need incentive to do this and to do that. Which is fine if you can control people through incentives. Uh, you know, you can control pollution through a carbon price. You can control um, layoffs through an expense rating system and so on. But what happens when you cannot control because you have no police behind is what is an issue because by exposing the true values, you basically have brought bad news about the goodness of society. And that probably can dis degrade, destroy uh, behavior in uncontrolled aspects of life. Um, and that's possible that we economists we are not only the bearers of bad news, but we also are destroyers of social norms. And if that's true, uh, that's, that's a caveat in our activity. We, you still need a carbon price to solve climate change, by the way. <laughs> we face the difficulty of uh, that people have a first impression. They look at direct effect of an economic policy. They rarely look at indirect effects, like GF, general human effects, like, you know, what happens if you impose rent control? Uh, if you have employment protection, it's a, it's a little bit the same argument in a sense. The direct effects are nice, and they're also good for equality, so they look very nice. But then if you think about the indirect effect on, on incentives, then you get, you get into trouble. Uh, but of course, people, they just see the direct effect and not the indirect effect. Leakage problem in, um, in uh, climate change control. Uh, uh, in the report I've written with, with Olivier Blanchard, we, we looked a little bit at, uh, at perceptions. For, as you might expect, for, for climate change, taxes are, are upset everybody, but people love subsidies. Now you expect that the subsidy is real tax, in a sense, because you, somebody else is going to be taxed. But yeah, the same people are going to tell you, yeah, oh no, carbon tax is, is a scandal, but yeah, the, uh, I love those subsidies. <laughs> um, I, we had the same thing actually with inheritance in tax. We, it, was, it was kind of funny because we, we asked people, uh, Stephanie Stancheva asked people to, do you like to have an inheritance tax, or should you be let uh, free to give your money to your children? And everybody says, ah, no tax. I should, I should be able to give money to my children. And then you ask them the question, the same people, you ask them the question, do you find it fair if different children start with very different wealth? So, oh, it's a scandal. You know? <laughs> and, and yeah, and they don't see the contradiction between the two points. And, and actually, we ourselves, you know, Intellectually, I'm all in favor of an inheritance tax, but I want to give my money to my children, right? I'm, I'm also schizophrenic, right? But you know, this is the kind of thing that you have to, to deal with. Ethical dilemmas, 
It's very important at the time of COVID, of course. People like Carol, for example, know pretty well about healthcare, uh, ethical dilemma. We have a very hard time in our society to confront them. So, for example, for choices of equipment or, or personnel in hospitals, of course, you, any such choice is going to mean that you are going to save some lives and, and basically kill some others by the very nature of the choice. But you never reason in those terms. You, don't, you never sacrifice people openly uh, because you have a limited budget. Uh, because that will not be acceptable in society. The society is not ready to do those ethical dilemma. I thought actually things improve a little bit with the shortage of ventilators in, in Italy and France because there was a discussion of actually who should be sacrificed. And yeah, people were willing to engage. So I, I thought that was some progress there. And that went, I think, in the right direction. But this is going to be all over the place. So my colleague Jean-François Bonnefond in Toulouse uh, has a pretty well-known article in science. He's a psychologist. Getting back to the old uh, trolley dilemma, but applying to the autonomous car. Now, when there is a danger of an accident and the driver has to choose between killing himself or herself and killing five pedestrians, it's taken like this. There's no deliberate choice. Uh, but of course, with the software, which has to be built in a cold state, um, you have to decide. Are you going to kill those five pedestrians or are you going to kill the driver? And yes, they have looked at the attitude of people with respect to that choice. And by the way, the funny thing is that people there, contrary to the uh, the standard trolley dilemma, they say, oh no, let's kill the driver. And then they say, I, but I don't want the state to regulate my car. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of funny, right? In terms of, uh, they understood pretty well what was going to happen. Poor understanding of statistics is well known. And of course, uh, the difficulty of communication with uh, divisive issues. So, so what shall we do? And that's where I don't have an answer, of course, but uh, <laughs> let me give you a couple of uh, considerations. The first consideration is that statistics don't work. They don't work well, which is terrible because we think the facts are important, and that's what should drive policy. Fundamentally, policy should be based on the facts. But in, within the population, it's very hard to use facts. Actually, there is this wonderful quote of Marcel Proust, the facts do not penetrate the world our beliefs live, where our beliefs live. That's, that's a very nice uh, way of saying it. That's my translation, it's actually nicer in French. But yeah, <laughs> it, you know, it's, 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 really, uh, it's really true. I mean, you know, statistics, you know, you can talk to people about statistics, they, they don't react. They understand, but they don't react. They, they forget anyway. And by the way, you know, the whole debate with the extreme right uh, attitude towards immigrants is that they, they actually quote totally wrong numbers. At least that, that's the case for France, but it's also the case for other countries as well. Uh, you can correct the statistics. It's never going to change the vote of people who actually vote for those parties. Um, it's difficult now. Is that because they don't change their attitude or any way they wanted to believe what they want to believe, I don't know. But that's, that's a big issue. Where the debate is, is on narratives. And for an economist or social scientist, narrative is not something interesting because it's not a basis on which to take decisions. Sure, I can find an immigrant who committed a crime and I can tell you the narrative about this immigrant actually committing an a very bad crime. But I can also find a narrative about an immigrant plight who actually crossed the channel to actually blah, blah, blah. I mean, I can tell you a, a narrative which is going to make you feel good about immigrants. And I prefer the latter, but you know, in a sense, none of them is scientific, right? Why should we care about one person? Well, the, the only thing which counts is the statistics, right? So that, that's really an issue, but this is a much, much more powerful way of communicating things. 
Now, what tricks do narrative use? They use wishful thinking, you know, what I mentioned earlier, the hope for a bright future. So in France, I don't know about the UK, but in France, the number of politicians, right wing, left wing, who say ecology should not be punitive. OK, so no carbon price. And this is it's a wonderful slogan. It works very well. You know, how can ecology, which is a nice thing, be associated with yeah. clinicians? And now it's, it's kind of, it works pretty well. Uh, perspective taking, which is what I was talking about, what's called transport theory, is basically taking a person and making this person, in a sense, better than a statistic. And their personal narratives work. There's, of course, a con confusion between correlation and causality. As everybody knows, you should not go to the hospital because your probability of dying there is actually much, much larger than your probability of dying at home. You know, this is a star kind of thing that, of course, that's the bread and butter of economists. And something which is very important is excuses, for, especially for antisocial behavior. So they can be crazy excuses, like many of the excuses we have heard about vaccines, or not. Uh, I'll come back to the replacement excuse. A replacement excuse is actually an excuse not to behave in a nice way, but which, are, which is grounded. So the replacement excuse is basically, if I don't do it, somebody else will, right? And you can find lots of examples um, and the, the Nazis, for example, they use this replacement excuse, but selling weapons to dictatorships, bribing officials to win a contract. The doctors who actually gave opioids, they, they use that excuse. You know, if I don't give opioids to that patient, the patient will get the opioids somewhere else. Uh, the professional athletes taking illegal drugs and so on and so forth. And we also do it in our everyday life. So, so it's an excuse, but it has some ground, right? Because if there is competition, then it's very easy for the person to switch and get the weapons or the, the drugs from somebody else. But of course, it's a good excuse also not to behave pro-socially. So let me take a second to talk about flimsy excuses, because they are very important. There's been a lot of research. Some of you in the room will know that research, but I'm, I'm fascinating by, totally fascinated by this research. It's called more wiggle room. One of the earliest papers on the topic was by Dana Weber and Kwon, and starts from something which is basically a standard test of generosity or post-sociality, in which basically you are given two choices on your computer, and you have the choice between a selfish action, let's call it action A, which is going to give you six pounds, but the other person you don't know with somebody else in the room will get only one pound. Or you can be generous, and then each of you will have five. OK, so the first payoff is the payoff of the dictator, the one who chooses. And the second payoff is the payoff of the second party. OK, so if I did it in this room, chances are that about three quarters of you will choose B. Now, by the way, it's entirely, entire self-signaling because the experiment, nobody else knows. There's no social signaling. Nobody else knows or will know what you have chosen. So it's entirely signaling to yourself, you know, the old Adam Smith internal spectator. Um, but, you know, okay, I lose one. I can be nice, right? It's only one pound. For multiple reasons, also regarding preferences, where, say, I'm being nice because I internalize the welfare of others, not as much as my welfare, but you know, internalize somewhat your welfare, at least one quarter of your welfare, uh, might explain this, but not quite. And this is why it becomes important. See, I mean, there's been thousands of experiments like this done. But consider this. Complicate things a little bit. There, are, there is a state of nature one. And in state of nature one, it's exactly the same trade off. I can be selfish, get six for me and one for you. Or I can, I can be generous and then we get five each. There is another state of nature which is equally likely, in which it's a no brainer. 
So if I choose A, I get 6, you get 5. If I choose B, I get 5, and you get 1. It's a no-brainer. Now, where it gets interesting is that I have, a, I have a button where I click, and I can choose whether to know the state of nature. It's completely free. But the question is, if you click, you will know the state of nature, one or two. If I don't click, I will never know, and I will have to choose between A and B, nonetheless. So what will you do? Well, do you want to learn the state of nature? Decision theory tells us we want to know the state of nature because we'll take a better decision. If it's state of nature one, at least for three quarters of us, we'll choose B. But in state of nature two, of course, we choose A. Now, what happened in the experiment? Do you guess? Well, what happens is that half of the people don't want to know the state of nature, and lo and behold, what do they choose? A, all right? They choose A because they have the excuse that they may not be selfish. Because, of course, they may not hurt, actually, the other person in state of nature, too. Now, this is a real bad excuse, right? This is a really, really bad excuse. Uh, and non nonetheless, half of the people choose not to know. And then they choose A, of course. Um, now, this experiment has been done in many different forms. So, for example, there are two dictators, and each dictator can... So going, going back to that one, the simpler one, where there's only one state of nature, but each dictator can basically impose a generous outcome. So if one of them at least chooses B, then that will be the generous outcome. And lo and behold, once there is another dictator, even so everybody's pivotal, they choose, they choose, they choose A. At least two thirds, at least, choose A. Um, but there are also experiments which are closer to life, so real life. So, so for example, there is a choice of not being there when the charity comes to your home. There is a choice of delegating a nasty decision like firing an employee to somebody else. Even so, you choose, of course, someone who is going to be tough and is going to fire the employee. So those flimsy excuses are actually very powerful. They resonate. And they are very bad excuses, but they still have a lot of impact on what we do. OK? Uh, let me skip the replacement excuse. So let me conclude, because um, it's going to be close to an hour now. So in the long term, of course, we, there are things we can do, like, of course, discredit uh, relativism and post-truth and instill respect for science. It's very hard. I mean, a country like France, which always claims it's a very rational uh, country with people, uh, you know, they, they inherit the, the, the French enlightenment of the 18th century and what, whatever. Uh, that's a country of Pasteur, of course. And you, then there's a big, a very strong anti-vax movement. Uh, and it's, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, date back to COVID. I mean, it's an old thing. There's lots of anti-vax in France. Homeopathy, for example, uh, many French people believe it's efficient. There are hundreds of uh, reports of academies of medicine and so on. <laughs> Useless. It's, it's very depressing. It's very depressing. And actually, it's reimbursed <laughs> by social security and, and by complementary, supplementary insurance and, and so on. It's, and, and then you, you, you get GMOs. I mean, you know, again, you may be against GMOs, but you know, at least we should have a rational debate, right? But nuclear power, you know, should we use nuclear power in, you know, against uh, climate change, for example? You know, we should have a rational debate on that. 5G, I don't talk about 5G. <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's just very, very hard. So you know, at some point, we have to, to invest in the long term. So. We have to invest in, in, the, in, in respect of scientists. Uh, of course, uh, you all remember five years ago, Chancellor Gove saying, uh, I think the people of this country are fed up, or I've had enough, I'm sorry, of experts. Now, this is not unusual. There are lots of um, 
Michael Gove's around the world. I mean, I can, you know, in each country, I can find you politicians who have had uh, similar says, you know, I mean, this one is pretty famous, but, and it's not new either. So I took a specific date, uh, 1793. <laughs> so you all know Edmund Burke uh, saying that the age of chivalry is gone. Poor economist. The glory of Europe is extinguished forever. Uh, come on. Um, but Lavoisier. So now we have, we have had the conservatives. Now we, we have the left wing people. So Lav, Lavoisier, as you know, was a great scientist, a chemist, and he was sentenced to death by the Revolutionary Court. But there was a very important experiment he wanted to finish. And that was a common good. Like, let me finish the, the experiment before I die. And no, uh, he could not finish the experiment because the president of the court said, the Republic doesn't need scientists. OK? So nothing new here. Uh, but, uh, but that's an issue. Now, it's hard actually to actually recreate a trust in, uh, in scientists. So, of course, we know that there are sources of corruption in our activity. And the most obvious one is money uh, that can actually distort our reporting and our research. There's a temptation, of course, to be a public intellectual. I mean, it varies across countries, but yeah. I also come from a country where being a public intellectual is something very important and you know, grants you a lot of respect, which is nice, but uh, it also comes with certain, uh, certain stands. And politics, of course, and again, you know, I'm not blaming politics here, and, but you know, there is also a, dangerous, a danger in mixing what you do in, in research and mixing your political opinion, which are very respectable on the side, you know, otherwise. Uh, because, you know, you may adopt very rigid uh, attitudes, you don't want to disappoint your fellow travelers, and even if you don't, there's this issue that people will say, anyway, you're saying that not because it's, it's your science, it's because you're left-wing or you're right-wing. And that's when it comes to that, there's an issue, right? Because people don't believe what you say anyway. So. And it's true for an economist, for, for in medicine, whatever fields. So that's really an issue. So, you know, we have to think more about how to get our act together and, and make sure we deserve the trust of the people. But also we need to have people engaging with experts. And, you know, it's not always easy. It's, it's easier to have and look at a good Netflix series or write a nice, you know, read a nice novel than than reading an economics book or, or whatever. <laughs> but we, we need to teach better at school. Um, we can make it fun, actually. I think we can make school much more fun than it is now. I mean, after all, you know, I was mentioning the, co the issue of correlation with co versus causality. I mean, there is a French uh, guy called Coluche. You may know him. He passed away a while ago. And he was a very popular person. He made lots of jokes. Uh, with crazy uh, correlations uh, interpreted as causality. And if, if humorists can, uh, can do that, you, what, why can't you do it? I mean, as a teacher, you, you can really explain why some reasoning. And same thing for RCTs. I mean, Pasteur did that in 1881. I mean, you know, it's very simple to explain. You can explain that to, to pupils in, in fifth grade or something. It's not that hard. But of course, we ourselves have to participate more in the public debate and, and try to understand the perspective. So do some perspective taking uh, uh, to better understand what we do wrong, because we do a lot of things wrong in terms of communication, that's for sure. OK, so let me conclude here. But uh, is COVID a catalyst for change or an echo chamber for weaknesses? I, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to be a catalyst for change. I'm sorry to be a bearer of bad news again, but uh, I, I wish it were. But clearly, we, need, we must use not only economists, but social sciences more broadly in order to understand um, the reluctance of people to adopt policies we find kind of obvious. And you know, in terms of thinking as a framework, and uh, I've been pushing that, of course, but you know, thinking about the common good as, as a way of uh, of organizing our thoughts about, about public policy. In any case, I was thrilled to be giving this lecture. I look forward to your questions, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>